Yet once it is a little while, the second coming of Jesus Christ, part one. Our passage today prophesies the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. When Jesus leaves the third heaven and sets his feet down on the Mount of Olives, the earth, the heavens, and the nations will shake. We're going to spend some time on this topic. Uh, The next few episodes will cover the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is a blessed topic to cover. Welcome to the Plenteous Redemption Podcast, where the cross and the culture are on a collision course for discussion. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require sign, the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. Under the Jews a stumbling block, under the Greeks foolishness, but under them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Now, here's your host, Thomas Irvin. Welcome back to the Plenteous Redemption Podcast. Thank you so much for being patient with me as we've had a bit of a break. We've had to take a bit of a pause. Uh, Things got so busy here that podcasting had to take a back seat, but that's okay. We can do that from time to time. It's not a huge deal. I will um, uh, try to make provision for that in the future, but uh, as of late, it's just been busy. We've been serving the Lord, been focused on the Lord, and and doing the work he's given us to do, and we praise him for it. We do hope he's honored and glorified. Thank you for for praying for us as we uh, try and accomplish all that the Lord's given us to do here. Um, This past month was tremendous. It was wonderful. It was busy. Um, It it just seemed to, it it seemed that there was no end to it all, but uh, it was a blessed time. Many souls were saved. Last month, all together between myself, Brother Keith, and the church, I mean, we there were probably pushing just under 200 people that trusted in Jesus Christ last month uh, at the church between everyone. Um, that that's that is a huge, huge, huge blessing, and worth setting a podcast to the side for. <laughs> but here we are again. We are in Haggai chapter two. We're going to continue making our way through this book. And uh, through this second chapter, Haggai chapter two, verses six through nine, for thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations and the desire of nations shall come. And I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts, the silver is mine, the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts, the glory of this latter house shall be greater than the former saith the Lord of hosts, and in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, the book of Haggai deals with time. It deals with time repeatedly. It's it's a major aspect of the book. The book is divided by time. Uh, people uh, in the book note, or, you know, the Lord notes what takes place. The, the prophecies of Haggai the prophet uh, all took place in the second year of Darius the king, and then were often given the day and the month. And, and so the, the book is built around time. In fact, the book opens with time. It opens with a group of people saying the time has not come. And this was used as an excuse to suspend service to the Lord and suspend doing what they knew they were supposed to be doing. And and of course, that was not sufficient in the Lord's eyes. That did not work out for the Lord. So a staple idea in this book is time. And of course, this idea is further expressed in, in our passage. Yet once, it is a little while. 
Haggai talks a lot about time. Time is an, is an unbelievably important aspect of each of our lives. That little phrase, yet once it is a little while, that is the date given to us for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> That's the closest you're going to get. So if you want a date, if you need a date, you want to make a, a, a prediction about the second coming of the Lord, you want to go and tell people when the Lord is coming, he's coming in a little while. That's when he's coming. And that's going to be made unbelievably clear in, in this uh, study that we're about to do. The Lord didn't give us a date. He didn't give us a time. In fact, he told us not to worry about it. it he, was, he was very clear about that. He said, look forward to my coming. Well, when you're coming, Lord, don't worry about it. Just look forward to it. I'm coming as a thief in the night. And so as much information as a thief provides you when they're going to come and rob your home, that's, that's how much information the Lord was willing to supply. Uh, he's coming in a little while, and that's, that's all we have. That's all we know, and that is more than sufficient. And if you require a date that is more specific, well, unfortunately, you'll be met with silence. The Lord will return in a little while, and as such, we should live as though that little while is going to run out momentarily. You should live each and every day as though that day is the day the Lord is going to return. That, that hour is the hour the Lord is going to return. That minute, that second, each and every day of our lives should be lived as though the Lord is coming any moment. Because he's coming in a little while. He will absolutely be here. What an amazing day that will be. Can you imagine what it's... It's difficult for me to imagine what it's actually going to be like when... when when we are in the presence of Jesus Christ, it'll be one thing to go through death's doors and, and to meet him that way, and that is more than sufficient for me. That's, that's fine. Uh, but to go out in the rapture, to be called up into the air to meet the Lord, and then to be seated around that throne, as, you, as we read about in Revelation chapters 4 and 5, and, and to, to, to be there worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ and to take part in what he has for us to take part in, it's it's a phenomenal idea. Now, repeatedly at different time periods, in anticipation first of his leaving the world, the Lord tells his disciples he will be returning to the Father in a little while. But as the narrative progresses, the Lord begins to inform them he will also return to the earth again, a second time in a little while. That is the only time frame given us. Uh, John really set the book of John really sets that narrative. The book of Hebrews adds some extra details in terms of his uh, use of the of the phrase "a little while." Uh, that's where we're going to find most of our information. Now, it's going to be an incredible event to to behold, and so let let's walk through this and and see what the Lord had to say about the topic and see what the Lord did and is going to do in response to it all. So just, just to refresh ourselves, Haggai chapter 2, verse 6, For thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. Now twice in biblical history, the Lord shook the heavens and the earth in a notable fashion. First on Mount Sinai, when the Lord gave the law, he gave his law to his people Israel, that mountain, there was an earthquake there, that mountain shook. And then secondly, on Mount Calvary, when the Lord Jesus Christ cried out, it is finished. Everything went dark. There was an earthquake. The veil rent. Uh, so many incredible things happened there. Um, but the idea of shaking things up happens uh, more, more than a little bit with the Lord. If you read through the Bible, it's, it's a repeated idea. And we're going to look at it in another study in more depth. But it's important to note here, he intends to reintroduce the world to the king of kings when he returns to this earth by shaking the heavens, shaking the earth, shaking all nations, shaking the sea, shaking the dry land. Everything's going to be shaken when Jesus Christ returns. That's going to be a pretty notable event. That's going to be something to look out for and some something to think about. Uh, but the Lord is coming. He is absolutely coming. And I hope you are prepared for that. I hope you're looking forward to that. It's an absolute fact. His church will not go through the tribulation. 
uh, the Lord will come and, and call his church up to meet him in the air, and then we will go back to, to uh, the third heaven with him, and, and a, a number of events will take place there specific to the church, and soon after that, the tribulation will begin, and uh, we will be in heaven with the Lord where he is doing what he ha- would have us to do during that time. Now, with all that in mind, let's look at Hebrews 12, verses 18 through 29. For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched, and that burned with fire, nor unto the blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of a trumpet, and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. For they could not endure that which was commanded, and if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned, or thrust through with a dart, And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. But ye are come unto the Mount Sion, and unto the holy city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly, uh, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel, see that ye refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, now listen to his promise, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word yet once more signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire." That's an incredible passage. There's a lot there to take in. And I hope you enjoy reading these large portions of Scripture. I hope, it's not a, I hope it doesn't drag you down. I hope it doesn't uh, bore you or, or is too burdensome on you. It's important that you read it and that you hear it, that you see it in its context, and, and uh, that, that that's the way that you're going to be able to gain proper understanding of the Word of God. Now, we're presented with a progression of events here that are illustrated by the receiving of the law on Mount Sinai. When Moses went up and received the, the, what, what came to be known as the Ten Commandments, the, the, those tablets that he, that he first broke and then received a second time, uh, he received a second time because God has no problem preserving his own word. He didn't forget it or, or, or you know, when Moses broke the tablets, he, he, God was not put out in some way, as though he didn't know what to do, you know, once the tablets were gone. So, but, but this event is, is illustrated by Moses going up on the mountain and receiving the word of God. And then a clear comparison is made by them who entreated the Lord. When they heard the law, they immediately recognized the impossibly high standard the Lord was setting for his people. Now, that verses the general assembly and the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven. The, the two, are, the two are, are compared and contrasted in this passage and the way they handle the way they handled the receiving of the word of God. The former asked the Lord not to speak these words again. <laughs> that makes very clear to all that following the law would not happen. Keeping the law would not happen. When they heard the incredibly high standard that God set for them, they immediately understood, we can't do this. Uh, the, law, the law served to define man's guilty status, not to provide a means of justification. That is very important to understand and can save you from a lot of confusion. Now, the former refused the word spoken. The latter instructed, don't refuse these words. Don't refuse him. Don't refuse him that spoke these words, because Christ is the key to all future events. Uh, You know, the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. And 
While the former refuse the words, the latter are told not to refuse him that is speaking the words. This passage also notes the contrast between that which is earthly and that which is heavenly. It, it puts a clear divide between the two. Moses and Abel gave God's people the best that earth had to offer. That's the law. That's the keeping of commandments. That's uh, These men obeyed God by faith, but their faith caused them to display a measure of works. And so that, that that's a very important distinction. But Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant, a heavenly solution for all men everywhere. You are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And, and that's a that's a massive distinction that we have today. Now, Christ spoke through blood. He, he spoke through the blood of sprinkling, as noted in this passage. And we are admonished not to refuse him that speaketh. He shed his blood. And because of that, because of that, the, the, the covenant that he established is so sound and so solid. How will you escape if you neglect so great salvation? You don't want to, you, you need the words. The words are extremely important. But don't miss him speaking, him who, who the, the man who is speaking the words. That's who you really need to be focused on. Now, there are consequences for refusing him that spake on earth, as illustrated by the rich man in Luke 16. He refused Moses and the prophets and thereby lifted up his eyes in hell, being in torment. And the one who spake from heaven <laughs> he shook the earth, and he promised he will once again shake the earth and the heaven, and according to Haggai chapter 2, the nations and the land and the sea, everything's going to be shaken. And according to Hebrews 12, all will be shaken. Uh, everything that shakes, let's put it that way, will be taken away, leaving us with a kingdom that will not be moved. You will only get that through Jesus Christ. There, there is no other way. You know, the, the Jews had their nation. They had God as their king, and then they, they, they begged God for a man to be their king, so they got what they wanted. They had a system of laws given to them by God. They had a religious system given to them by God. They had land. They had boundaries. They had a kingdom. It was shaken. Now, as the church, our only hope our only stability is the fact that we are in Christ Jesus. Outside of that, we'd be shaken and tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine like everybody else in the world. It's our connection, it's our, it's our stance in Christ Jesus that saves us from this. And that, that's something to shout about. That's something to be joyful about. That's good reason to praise the Lord. Now, the narrative of these events is laid out very well in the book of John from the Lord's departure from this world until his second coming. This phrase is used repeatedly, yet a little while. Look at John 7, verses 32 through 38. And verse 32 says, The Pharisees heard that the people murmured such things concerning him. And the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. Then said Jesus unto them, Yet a little while am I with you, and then I go unto him that sent me. Ye shall seek me, and shall not find me. And where I am, thither ye cannot come. Then said the Jews among themselves, Whither will he go? That we shall not find him. Will he go unto the dispersed among the Gentiles, and teach the Gentiles? What manner of saying is this that he said, Ye shall seek me, and shall not find me. And where I am, thither ye cannot come. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. In this instance, the Lord is addressing the men sent to take him. The Pharisees are upset with them. They have hired guards, to, uh, you know, to uh, a band of men to go and take the Lord. And when they get there, the Lord boggles their minds by informing them, <laughs> yet a little while I am with you, and then I go unto him that sent me. He doesn't even address the fact that they are there to 
apprehend him, to, to take him. And they don't address the fact that they are there to apprehend him and take him. It's like they, they're so boggled by what he said, they go back and they say, never a man spake as this man spake. <laughs> they, they don't know what to do. They don't know what to say. And the Jews are so perplexed by it, they're, they're murmuring amongst themselves, what is he talking about? What does he mean? How's he going to do that? Where's he going? Is he going to the Gentiles? I mean, he knows we would never go to the Gentiles. Surely that's what he means. And so their their confusion is, is astounding. Now, in their confrontation, it seems the Lord, you know, he he's so messed with their minds that they they fell off the task that was given them. Now, on earth, he always did that which pleased his father. And he looked forward to being reunited with his father in heaven after completing his father's will on earth. And he absolutely did that. There is no doubt the Lord, every moment of of every day of his existence on earth, he set about to do his father's business. From the time he was a young boy until until the day they took him uh, to to be nailed to the cross and and he rose from the dead, he, he is always about his father's business and completing his father's will on earth. And so he informs these people that that he's leaving, he's going away. But notice this passage ends <laughs> with a moment of awkward public ministry, and that that's the. It's good for our brethren to read this, and I hope I hope those of you that listen to this will read this and consider what the Lord did here, because public ministry is shunned, though it shouldn't be. It should be widely accepted. It's 100% biblical. It's exactly how every prophet, every apostle, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, it's how all of them got God's word to, to unbelieving people. Uh, there, there are a few instances of, of God's preachers in the Bible preaching to uh, you know unbelieving people, we'll say it that way, not, not necessarily lost people, but unbelieving people to some extent, in a synagogue or, or in a church or, or in the temple or, or within the confines of some, building, of some religious building. But primarily, it was done publicly in the streets for everybody to hear because that's how you're going to represent Jesus Christ in this world today. That's how you're going to get the word of God to people in this world today. They're not going to come to you and get it. I don't know if you've noticed lately, but the world around us is not very interested in Jesus Christ and his word. As free as you make it, you know, it, it costs a lot of money to produce this podcast. It's available to anybody that wants to hear it. Um, there's just not a lot of people that want to hear. But, I mean, you heard that long passage we read from Hebrews 12. You know how many people that's going to throw off? <laughs> I don't want to sit and listen to a long passage from the Bible. Just tell me something interesting. Tell me who Cain and Abel married. <laughs> Tell me how Jesus turned water into wine. You know, what about those giants? Are, are there dinosaurs in the Bible? Nobody wants to sit down and study the book of Haggai and have it pick you apart. They just want sound, they want Twitter like sound bites. That's all they want. And, and so, even Bible believing Christians, when it comes to the idea of public ministry and making the Word of God available publicly, in your city, in your nation, in your country, in your house, um, nobody wants to do that. They, they shun that idea. Well, when you shun that idea, you're shunning what the Lord did, what the apostles did, what the disciples did, what the prophets did. That's how they got God's word out. That's how you and I are supposed to get God's word out. But if you'll notice, it's the last day of this feast, and the Lord stands up in the last day that uh, in the last day that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. He stands up and basically preaches the gospel. Now, that had to be an awkward moment. <laughs> They're there for a feast. They're there in this celebration. Uh, they have their own ideas, their own their own desires, their own wants. You know the the things that they're doing that day. They don't want to be interrupted. They're they're going about their own way. They don't want Jesus shoving his religion down their throat and 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 they whine and cry about about being 
offended or, or upset by the words that you're speaking. And now words are violence. And we just have a world full of weak, effeminate people who can't handle the word of God. They can handle murderous movies and sexualized movies and drug-filled music and sexualized music, and uh, they can handle all sorts of reprobation. That's no problem. It's someone who might stand up and preach that you need to repent and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ before you die and go to hell. Uh, that's where they get a little uncomfortable. But this is, this is, it's bigger than those people getting uncomfortable. Our brethren who claim to be Bible-believing Christians, they're uncomfortable standing up and preaching it. You have made it awkward to go out and preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's shameful and needs to be fixed. So the Lord did it. You can do it. Paul did it. Peter did it. James, John, they all did it. Jonah did it. Um, I mean, every, every preacher in the Bible, to some extent, preached publicly outdoors for everybody to hear. So uh, you and I were responsible to do the same. Now, our point here is, is that the Lord is telling these people, I'm leaving. I'm leaving. You better come to me while you can. You got just a little while, and I'm with you. And of course, this is repeated in John 12, verses 30 through 36. Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. The people answered him, We have heard out of the law that Christ abideth forever. And how sayest thou, the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Then Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while ye have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. While ye have light... Believe in the light, that ye may be the children of light. These things spake Jesus, and departed, and did hide himself from them. The Lord reminds them, you have a limited amount of time to receive the light. We, we so take that for granted. This idea, I'll get right eventually. I'll do right eventually. I'll get saved eventually. I'll have my sins forgiven eventually. I'm, I'm, I'm working on it. I'm thinking about it. I'm moving in that direction. I'm, I'm probably going to do it. <laughs> you better trust in the light while you have it. Our situation is not much different right now. You, you and I, we, we have a limited amount of time on earth, as we said in the opening, that either death is going to take you or the Lord Jesus Christ is going to return. One of the two is absolutely going to happen. You better live for the Lord now. If you're not saved, you better get saved now while you have the opportunity. You don't know when death's coming for you. You don't know when death's going to take you. You don't know when you're going to pass from this life to the next. You don't know when Jesus is going to come back to the clouds and yell out, come up hither and take his church away. You don't know when any of that's going to happen. You better walk in the light while you can before the darkness come upon you. And when the darkness comes upon you, your options are, it, it, it's over. If the darkness come upon you through death, you'll spend eternity in torment. If it comes upon you through the, through, the, through the rapture of the church and you being left behind to go through the tribulation, it's not going to bode well for you. You don't want to try and go through the tribulation. People who say they're going through the tribulation... I, I question whether they've ever even read the book of Revelation. If, if that's an idea you have in your head, I challenge you to sit down, read through the book of Revelation twice in one sitting, and then come back and tell me again you think the church is going to go through the, through the, through the tribulation. I, I, I would argue you've never even read the book of, of, of Revelation if you think the church is going to go through, through the tribulation. But uh, whatever, maybe you have. But the Lord reminds them again, the time... The, 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 the limited time they have to receive the light. This fact is still true for us today. Your opportunity to receive the light could be hindered by death or the Lord's second coming. Don't play with God. Both possibilities are imminent. 
We have no idea when we will walk through death's doors or when the Lord himself will return for his bride. People, people, they so often make the terrible mistake of assuming they have ample time to trust in Jesus Christ. Time is always fleeting. We, I, I, we go out witnessing a lot here in Uganda, and I ask these people all the time that, you know, they, they will receive the gospel. They will, they will agree with it. They will understand it so easily. And then they'll say, let me think about it. <laughs> and so I I'll, I'll always ask them, so no problem. It's up to you. You know, you, you take your time, you think about it, but let me ask you this before you go, when are you going to die? And the look on their face when you ask that question, it, it's so sobering because when you really think about the fact that you are not promised another five minutes, death could take you at any time. And you were just given the opportunity to have your sins forgiven for eternity or to spend eternity in hell. And you said, let me think about it. <laughs> that's, that's an unsettling proposition. It's an unsettling proposition for the preacher who, who believes you understood what was said. And it's got to be unsettling for, for the, the person receiving the preaching because you own it. You heard the gospel. You had an opportunity to call upon the name of the Lord. And you said, let me think about it. <laughs> Maybe later. It's, it's a scary idea. You don't want to play with God. Now, for us, yet a little while... And the Lord will return, first to call his bride away, secondly to establish his kingdom at his second coming. Now the Lord's telling these people, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not here with you very long. You better get it together. And the idea is the same today. Like the body of Christ is only going to be here for so long, and the body of Christ is responsible for preaching the gospel. And unfortunately, as we talked about in the last passage, they're not doing a wonderful job of it. They won't go out publicly. They, they, they might preach it on Easter, you know, <laughs> Sunday. They might preach the gospel or something along those lines. It's just uh, a, a few churches might go door knocking and leave a little hang, a bag hanging on your door, which is good. You should do that. You should, be, you should be preaching the gospel both publicly and from house to house. The problem is a few churches go house to house and unbelievably few preach publicly. And so... People just get left to their own, and, and they die and they go to hell because, uh, because Bible-believing Christians are too dignified to go and preach the gospel the same way their Lord and Savior did it. And it's a shameful idea. Next is John 13, verses 31 through 38. Therefore, when he was gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself and shall straightway glorify him. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. Ye shall seek me. And as I said unto the Jews, whither I go, you cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall men know that you are my disciples." If you have love one to another, Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whither goest thou? Jesus answered, Whither I go, you can you canst not come. Whither I go, you canst not follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. Peter said unto him, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. Jesus answered him, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? <laughs> Verily, verily, I say unto thee, the cock shall crow. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, the cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. This time the Lord's addressing his disciples. He includes them in the limited nature of their time with the Lord Jesus Christ. Just as with the second coming, the Lord gives no specific times, yet a little while I am with you. But the Lord was going somewhere that even his disciples could not yet go. But in the passage, as well as in John 14, the Lord makes very clear to them, he will prepare a place for them and he will come back and receive them unto himself. 
the, the hard part here for the disciples is they were all on board when he said that to the Jews. They may not have fully understood, but they're like, okay, you know, where, where the Lord's going, they can't go. But now the Lord is telling them, where I'm going, you can't go. My disciples, my apostles, you're not going. Not right now. But when I go, when I go, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And then I will come back and I will receive you unto myself. And, and that's, that's wonderful consolation. That is a, a truth that is still uh, loud and clear for the body of Christ today. And, and you should count on it. Now, speaking of John 14, look at John 14, verses 15 through 29. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him. For he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But ye see me, because I live ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you, and he that hath my commandments, and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us, and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and will come unto him, and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Ye have heard how I said unto you, I go away, and come again unto you. If you loved me, you would rejoice, because I said I go unto the Father. For my Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it come to pass, that when it come to pass, ye might believe. The latter chapters of John, the Lord spends ample time preparing his disciples for his departure. And as you read those chapters, it's clear it was confusing to the apostles. Uh, they really struggled with it. They really had a hard time with it. But he, nonetheless, the Lord... It was not without proper preparation. It was not without trying from the Lord to, uh, to, to get these men the information and the knowledge that they needed uh, to, to understand, and, and they really struggled with it. But in this passage, the Lord not only prepares them for his departure, but he tells them the Holy Spirit will come in his stead. Now, the disciples were already familiar with the Spirit, and in fact, there's this in this distinctive change, if you look at the wording, what the Lord said, he said that they, they knew the Spirit. He had been with them. The change that is noted in this passage, he would soon be in them. That's a, that's a drastic difference. Rather than having the Spirit, oftentimes in the Bible, men had the Spirit on them or with them. Now, the body of Christ, we have the Spirit sealed within us, inside us. That, that is a massive change. That is an unbelievable change that we should all be thankful for. But again, the Lord tells them, yet a little while, the world would no longer see him, but he is telling his disciples ahead of time so that they would be properly prepared for his departure. And then as it progresses, the Lord armed them with the proper knowledge of his intent to depart this world, but he also made provision for them by way of the coming Holy Spirit. Now, you're going to see in this passage and in the next one, the Lord also begins to define the, the, the relationship the body of Christ is going to have with the Father in heaven through Jesus Christ. 
we, we, a little bit of that was noted in, in John 14. Uh, but look at John 16, verses 7 through 33. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they believe not on me, of righteousness because I go, on, I go to my Father, and ye see me no more, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit when he, when he, the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. So the Lord is telling them that there are things I want to tell you, but I can't tell you now because you don't have the Holy Spirit. But when you have the Holy Spirit, he's going to fill in those gaps. He's going to enable you. He's going to make you capable of being able to receive what I have to tell you. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine, and shall show it unto you a little while, and ye shall not see me. And again a little while, and ye shall see me, because I go to the Father. Then said some of his disciples among, among themselves, <laughs> What is this that he saith unto us? A little while, and you shall not see me. And again, a little while, and you shall see me, because I go to the Father. They said, therefore, what is this that he saith? A little while, we cannot tell what he saith. Now Jesus knew that they were desirous to ask him, and said unto them, Do ye inquire among yourselves of that I said, A little while, and you shall not see me. And again, a little while, and you shall see me. Verily, verily, I say unto you that you shall weep and lament but the world shall rejoice, and ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. A woman, when she is in travail, has sorrow because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish. For joy that a man is born into the world, and ye now therefore have sorrow. But I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. And in that day you shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs, but the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs. But I shall show you plainly of the Father, at that day ye shall ask in my name, and I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you. At that day ye shall ask in my name, and I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you. For the Father himself loveth you because ye have loved me, and have believed that I came out and have believed that I came out from God. I came forth from the Father, and am come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. His disciples said unto him, Lo, now speakest thou plainly and speakest no proverb. Now are we sure that thou knowest all things and needest not that any man should ask thee. By this we believe that thou camest forth from God. Now, of course, the Lord has to challenge them on their statement. Jesus answered them, Do ye now believe? Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come that ye shall be scattered every man to his own, and shall leave me alone, and yet am I not alone, because the Father is with me. These things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. <laughs> I have overcome the world. Now, I know, again, that's, a, that's such a long passage. Why would you read all that? Because it's so good. <laughs> It's good for you to hear. It's good for me to hear. It's good for you to read. It's good for me to read. Uh, it's, that is nourishment for your soul. Now, as the Lord further expounds to his disciples the relationship between his departure and the coming of the Holy Spirit, he also informs them of the relationship that will be established for them with the Father in heaven through Jesus Christ. 
Everything we have is through Jesus Christ as Christians. He is the foundation. He is the cornerstone. He is the chief cornerstone. He is preeminent. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by him. But here we have this wonderful relationship with the Father because we have believed in Jesus Christ, because we love Jesus Christ, because we look forward to his coming. We get all these wonderful, incredible things that we don't deserve. We get the Holy Spirit. We get a relationship with the Father. Our sins are forgiven. We have an inheritance in heaven. We'll rule and reign with Christ. Uh, We can receive rewards for our labors here and now. God is good to us. We have a good God. I hope you serve him. I hope you live for him. I hope you've given your all to him. Um, (laughs) yet Yet in a little while, he's coming back. But he's telling his people, he's telling his disciples here, in a little while, I'm leaving. But I'm not leaving you comfortless. I'm not leaving you alone. My physical presence won't be here, but you will have my spirit. You have a relationship with my father. You have my word. You have the church. You have the body of Christ. You have, you, I mean, you have so much at your fingertips. You have all that you need. And the Lord made all that available to us. Now, in this discourse, the cryptic talk of leaving the world in a little while begins to be too much for the disciples to bear. You know, again, it was fine when he said that to the Jews. You know, maybe later he'll tell us what he means uh, as long as we get to go with him. Well, now he's telling his disciples, you're not going. Not right now. I will go and I will prepare a place for you, but right now you're not going. And both events, his departure and his return, will happen in a little while. And this became the source of the confusion for his disciples. You're telling us that you're, you're, you're leaving to go to the Father, and then you're telling us you're coming back. Well, when? How? Why? What is, what, what is going on? Why are you leaving? Why, why can't we go with you? You know, that, that's the, the, the main thought going through their minds. But uh, this notes a slight change in the use of the term, yet in a little while. Until now, it was used to speak of the time of his departure from the earth. And now he's added a second, a little while, which speaks of his return, his second coming, and is directly related to our study in Haggai chapter 2. Now, in John 16, he informs the disciples he will depart. They will lament, but in a little while, (laughs) the Lord will return. And this is explained further in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 31 through 39, It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. That'd be a good thing to remember. That'd be a good thing to tell people. When they mock God, they mock Jesus Christ, they don't believe the word of God, or they uh, they think sin is a joke and something to be played with. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Don't do that. Don't fall into his hands. Have him place you in his hands. The hands that no man can leave. You want to be in those hands uh, you don't want to fall into those hands. <laughs> it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, but to call to remembrance the former days in which, after you were illuminated, you endured a great flight of afflictions, partly while you were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly while you became companions of them that were so used. For ye had compassion of me and my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and enduring substance. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward, for ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise for yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them that draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. That time of lamenting may not have been limited to the apostles. Here we read of a persecuted people who took joyfully the spoiling of their own goods. How would you handle that? I don't know that I would handle it very well. I I pray the Lord not put me, not allow me to be in a position to find out. I've come to enjoy safety (laughs) and to enjoy 
not being robbed and spoiled and persecuted and, and afflicted. And, and uh, though it seems those days are coming, evil men and seducers wax worse and worse. This planet is going insane and, and uh, we're expected to go with it and we're not. At least you shouldn't. And if you don't, if you don't, you're going to be subject to violence and to anger and, and everything else that they, they try and throw at us. So these people, they were persecuted. They were able to endure such afflictions because they were convinced that in heaven they have a better and enduring substance. Is it, would that be consolation for you if you were persecuted and, and spoiled and afflicted? It was for them. But more importantly, having done the will of God, they might receive the promise. Now listen to this. <laughs> Their Lord and Savior is coming for them, and he will, not, he will not tarry. What a consolation. You know, that life's difficulties, we, we've got consolation in Christ Jesus. We've got so much to look forward to. We have, we have hope. We have a blessed hope. We sorrow not even as those who have no hope. We have this consolation in Jesus Christ. He's coming back for us. Things here might get pretty wild before it's over with. Uh, things might get pretty gloomy. They might get pretty dark. But Jesus Christ is coming back for his people, and he will not tarry. He returned to heaven to prepare a place for you and for me. And in a little while, he will come and receive you and receive me unto himself. He's going to rapture his church, and then he will return in a little while after that, and he will defend Israel in their day of terrible trouble. The time of Jacob's trouble will end with Jesus Christ setting his feet atop the, the, the Mount of Olives. We can read about it here in Zechariah 14, verses 1 through 7. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee, for I will gather all nations against Jerusalem. Now, when he gathers those nations, you think he's going to shake them up? <laughs> and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azal. Yea, ye shall flee like as ye, ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah." Sounds like the earth's going to be shaken that day. It sounds like the nations are going to be shaking that day. And the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. And it shall come to pass in that day that the light shall not be clear nor dark, but it shall be one day which shall be known to the Lord, not day, not day nor night, but it shall come to pass that at evening time it shall be light. Haggai prophesies the Lord will return in a little while. Then John establishes the narrative. The Lord came into the world. He returned to the Father. And then in a little while, he will return again to earth. Upon his return, he will shake the heavens. He will shake the earth. And he will shake all nations. The result, the desire of all nations shall come. This reality was prophesied to Zerubbabel, Joshua, and the residue of the people as a means of encouragement for them in their efforts to persevere in rebuilding the temple. It's as though the Lord was trying to say, wherefore comfort one another <laughs> with these words. Thank you so much for your time. I pray this presentation of the Lord's second coming was a help to you. Please consider leaving a five-star rating as well as an encouraging comment wherever you listen to this podcast. Thank you for listening, and God bless. We hope you enjoyed this podcast. You can learn more about our ministry by visiting www.plenteousredemption.com. 
You can hear more Plenteous Redemption podcast audio at www.plenteousredemption.media. Please comment below if this podcast has been a help to you. Also, inform us of future topics that would interest you. Thank you again for listening to the Plenteous Redemption podcast.